One thing I've learned about presidential campaigns is that you'll almost never catch a candidate in New York City. Unless, of course, they need to raise some money. And last week, that was the case when three U.S. presidents, Biden, Obama, and Clinton, all gathered at Radio City Music Hall for what the Biden campaign called, quote, the most successful political fundraiser in American history. And we just have to take their word for it, in part because we weren't able to get in. But here's the gist. Tickets started at $250 on the low end and $100,000 on the high end, which got you a photo with all three presidents, an entrance to a private reception. There were performances by Queen Latifah, Lizzo, and an appearance from Stephen Colbert. In the end, the campaign says it raised more than $25 million. But this wasn't just another gathering of the rich and famous. It's an example of something the Biden campaign has done really well. Courting big donors, and just in general, raising a lot of money. In February alone, the Biden campaign and the Democratic Party raised $53 million dollars bringing their total cash on hand, as of the beginning of March, to $155 million. That's more than $50 million ahead of where Donald Trump and the RNC say their current fundraising totals are. Which, theoretically, should allow Biden's campaign to build out a more robust operation than their opponents. But, to this point, Biden's money advantage is yet to solve his political problems. Like weak poll numbers against Trump, continued concerns about his advanced age, and the enduring critiques of the administration's role in the war in Gaza that cropped up at Radio City when activists disrupted the event several times. So, with the general election in its early stages, I wanted to check in on the dollars and cents of 2024, on Biden's impressive totals, Trump's financial situation, and all the things money can't buy. Today, it's all about the Benjamins. From the New York Times, I'm Estet Herndon. This is The Run-Up. So I've been going to f- political fundraisers for over two decades. And I will tell you, that night was electric. Mm-hmm. I wanted to talk with someone who did get into that Radio City event. Indulge me with some, like, uh, snoopy questions. Like, did you see anybody cool? Were the bi- or were the, like, biggest celebrities the presidents themselves? Um, well, without a question, you know, the biggest celebrities were the presidents. This is Robert Wolf. He sat in the orchestra. I have to admit, you know, for me, I went with my wife, and it felt like a great date night. Uh-huh. You know, we, you know uh, we don't come to the city all that often. And so it was great to see, you know, Queen Latifah before and— and Lizzo and and Ben Platt and people that, you know, I yeah. wouldn't necessarily go see perform. And obviously Colbert as the moderator, you know, he's going to be funny, yeah. right? There's a lot of tongue in cheek there. So for me, it was kind of like, it was just a fun night. Wolf is a prolific Democratic fundraiser and Wall Street veteran. Most of my career, I was on Wall Street at Solomon Brothers for about a decade. Mm-hmm. And then I moved to UBS, where I was there uh, 18 years as the former CEO and chairman of the Americas and uh, president and COO of the investment bank globally. Wolf was an early fundraiser for Obama, an informal advisor to his presidential campaign. And like a lot of big donors, he later served in Obama's administration, including on the Economic Recovery Advisory Board after the 2008 financial crisis. He's also what's been called a bundler. I can't say I, I, I love the uh, the name, but um, <laughs> bundler is you 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 raise money and then you raise other people. So let's just say I am going to an event and I ask ten other people to give, you know, ten grand each, and they do. Then Robert Wolf will have not only his ten grand assigned to him, but also that extra hundred grand. And if you raise X amount of money, you get invited to fun things. <laughs> it's a way to supercharge your ability to donate as an organizer of other people's money along with your own. Correct. Got it. And I'm not a bundler today. Now, Wolf serves on the Biden campaign's National Finance Committee, an elite group of some of its biggest donors. So he's well known in Democratic circles and is well appreciated for his insights and his wallet. 
I thought he would be a good person to give me the lay of the land when it comes to big money in politics. How does it work? And what should we expect when it comes to big donors and President Biden? So I had the honor of seeing President Biden um, where I was able to chat with him in January at a fundraiser in New York City. For me, I'm not there to ask for anything, Mm -hmm. okay? I'm there to thank him, to let him know, you know, thank him what he's doing on gun violence or thank him what he's doing with respect to Ukraine, Mm -hmm. Uh, my wife and I. How much money does that take? It was expensive. Can I know how much? I think I think we wrote a check that night. It was high. I think <laughs> <laughs> I like to, I, I just don't know what the scale of high is. I mean, listen, you can write checks as low as a dollar and ten dollars. I think we wrote a check for like fifty thousand okay. at dinner. Okay. We've we've spent money on politics over the last twenty years. I, I, I was I, one of the questions I have is just how much. Have you spent, do you think, an aggregate? And is there a single thing? Is there is the $50,000 the most you've written for a thing? No. What's the most one check you've written? I think it was 100000 For what campaign? Uh, Hillary's. For Hillary's. Yeah. And how much do you think you've probably given an aggregate? Um, You know, I, I think you can look at the non-PAC side or non-committee mm-hmm. side. I mean, my guess is in aggregate, I mean, my guess is in excess of a million dollars we've mm-hmm. given. How did you get into political, like, giving and fundraising, period? Well, I appreciate that. Um, you know, back in the early 2000s, for the most part, it was called FIRE, Finance, Insurance, and Real Estate. Oh. And if you looked at everyone giving, the top people, the top companies were either finance, insurance, or real estate. At that time, you know, I was a senior executive at UBS. You know, being on Wall Street, being a senior executive, it got you the opportunity to meet a lot of people. So I got involved early, uh, specifically with the Kerry campaign. Okay. I was anti-Bush. I was against the war. Mm -hmm. I had two young boys, and I just felt like at that time, you know, it's not the direction I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And so I got very active with Kerry. And then it's the list you can't get off of. If you can get me off of, let me know how. But it's the gift that keeps on giving. And then I hosted the first fundraiser for President, then Senator Obama in New York in March of 07. We, you know, raised a ton of money and I became one of his biggest fundraisers nationally. Again, and like, I guess, does that just like, do you just text your phone and say, hey, I have this politician. I think he's really interesting. Like, what's actually the process of translating your interest in somebody to like a larger group and then the money part too. Yeah, so it was interesting. In 2007, you know, most of the Democratic Party was all in Hillary. I was able to meet Obama. I aligned with a lot. It was like that, that you know, you know, bro card. We're, we're both Ivy League guys. We both like sports. His mother died of cancer. My dad was going through cancer. All those things. He was against the, the war part was big, yeah. too. Especially. And, then the, and then against the war. And so what happened was I just invited people like, hey, you should meet this guy. And they all knew of him from the 2004 convention. Yep. And so, you know, with his famous speech, you know, it's not red state, blue state, we're the United States, so on and so forth. And so what happened was. I became that guy, you know, people at law firms wanted to meet him, even if it was just to meet him or get their book signed Mm. that he had audacity of hope or um, take a picture with him. People wanted to get to know this guy. Uh And it was a cheap date back then. It was only like (laughs) $2,100. That's, and so they're like, you could, they could meet him at a fairly accessible price. Exactly. Mm. Is it? access driven like when you're saying people want to find, sign a book they want to meet them like what is the incentive if, if we're thinking about why people want to give i mean politics is an aphrodisiac right the, you're the most powerful person in the world at that time you know most people did not get the opportunity to meet a president in their life and here's mm-hmm. a possibility to meet someone that could become the president I, I get what you're saying you're saying particularly when you were getting started what you were what you were able to connect people with is an ability to meet people they wanted to and uh, uh, and they have the means and access to be able to do it through you. Yeah, I mean, I became kind of that guy. I mean, I guess, again, I'm still thinking kind of broadly before we talk about Biden specifically. Um, what is the brand like for Democrats among Wall Street right now? And how has that shifted maybe over the time in which we're talking? Yeah, about? you know, I think it was always about 40% were staunch Democrats 
40% were staunch Republicans because of Reaganomics, which is when I started Wall mm -hmm. Street in the 80s. And 20% would go either way. Mm. And that That's kind of surprising to me. I think of that as more of a Republican crowd, maybe. It's not because, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of other issues important to them and not everyone votes with their pocketbook. I know that <laughs> they think they view us as uh, as banksters instead <laughs> of bankers. But, um, you know, what I would say is that um, I would say when it was um, McCain, Obama, it was clearly Obama got, I'd say, 100 percent of the 20 percent. Mm -hmm. Uh, when it was Romney, Obama, I would say Romney was the majority of Wall Street. Mm -hmm. He was kind of a Wall Street guy, knew yep. them all. Um, I think with Clinton and Trump, in, in my opinion, I think Hillary and Bill, you know, just are so well liked in New York. And um, and I, my gut tells me there were Republicans that went her way, not for Trump as well. Um and then on the Biden Trump, it's hard to even assess because it was such a crazy period. Yeah. There was no real campaign. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was going to ask you about know. that. And I guess I'm asking about right now, too. Is there a sense, I, you know, I've heard you previously talk about the ways that you think the progressive wing of Democrats has become too anti Wall Street. I'm wondering where you view the Biden Democratic Party on that question. And do you think that the party right now makes it easy for you to pitch them to your fellow? Wall Street folks. I, I mean, honestly, I don't think we're front and center. Wall Street's not who it was and what it was. You know, you can raise money from anywhere, you know, in almost any sector there is. I mean, media companies yeah. and everyone, you know, tech companies, you know, I don't have to tell you how many firms now lobby. Yeah, I guess I'm, that's part of what <laughs> I'm asking. Has small dollar donations, has the ability to raise money from other yeah, groups grassroots, changed it? Yeah, yeah, yeah grassroots okay. are, are, it's more important to get grassroots money than you know, my couple grand or whatever I give, uh, a little more than that. But, um, you know, what I would say is that, first of all, Wall Street wants to give their economic view. They don't like necessarily to get in the middle of the riffraff because I think they're nervous about being the, the meme or being in a polarizing environment with their employees, right? I, I, I think um, voting is very um, personal today. And there is no generic Wall Street voter anymore. This idea that, you know, you know, the progressives think that Wall Street's voting with their pocketbook, I think is BS. Um, you know, they may care about climate more than the progressives care about climate or they may care about gun reform. Mm -hmm. Gun reform for me is front and center. Mm -hmm. My wife works at Sandy Hook Promise mm -hmm. on gun violence prevention and mental health. And so gun, gun violence for me is front and center. So y'all are one issue voters in the when, same? Okay. Yeah, I, I would say there is no one issue vote. It used to be because of Reaganomics, right? Taxes, mm -hmm. right? Or anti-regulation. That's changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. You know, the other thing, and this was going to get to kind of Biden specifically, is like our, we have been talking to so many people about how this election puts them in a kind of pickle because for the majority of Americans, they want, you know, they talk about wanting other options or just being not happy with having the same options again. When you're in those circles, how is, how's like kind of your community feeling about Biden? Right now. It, are, Which just, community? I'm, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Because uh, I have two sons in their late 20s. And I, that I would, would be, be curious about That would them. be a very different conversation. Hey, we, we could, we could, <laughs> I would have that answer, but I'm really specific to, I was thinking specific to fundraisers. Like, yeah. is it easy to raise money for Biden right now? The answer is yes. It's easy because um, there's now a campaign. Okay. It's Trump versus Biden. Um, and President Biden was not candidate Biden. So this whole idea of Democratic bedwetters or, hey, he's got to get out, I was totally the other way. Mm -hmm. I, in my opinion, you know, that, that transition to becoming more of the candidate took place at the State of the Union. Mm. And that State of the Union, in my opinion, I thought he was fantastic. I think he has a hop in his step. I love that he's now out and about. I like that Kamala. Vice President Harris, I'm sorry, I've known her a long time. No, that's okay. I think I love that she's out and about. And now we're in a campaign. 
people are more active and engaged. Yeah, I, I, I it's interesting. You're, um, I like that you're pointing to State of the Union as that hinge point because I did feel like there was like the bedwetting had reached its peak right before then, right? Like there was whether it was the uh, age questions from the special counsel, whether it was a kind of polling. The you know. calls I was getting. I, I, I want to hear no, about those. Insane. I want to hear about like no, what were people was... were people. Do you, are you someone who feels the angst when people are angsty? It was insane. I was getting calls, you know, why is he running? Do you think he should run? Hey, he's running. Let's not even have that discussion. Let's talk about he's running and who he's going to be competing against. And let's put all of our inner anxiety into helping him win. But I was fielding calls nonstop because, listen, people were seeing, you know, President Trump and Nikki Haley. They were in campaign mode. Yeah. So... Yes, I was fielding it as that nonstop. Age specifically or other stuff? I think other stuff. I th- I think age. I think there was just, you know, I, listen, there was a nervousness. You know, can anyone beat Trump? The answer is yes. Mm-hmm. And now we're in a situation where it's much more mano a mano. Mm-hmm. And we now have choices to make. Yeah. And forget about what was. Let's look at what is. Oh, um, let me ask something different then. Yeah. Why aren't your sons convinced? My sons are very convinced okay. that they will be voting for President Biden versus President Trump. Mm-hmm. But we were talking, you and I, about the excitement and the issues. Yeah. You know, our dinner table issues are about, you know, you know, Gaza and humanitarian. There's a big debate going on in the Gen Z generation versus Definitely. the older generation. There's a debate going on, you know, on climate action versus I'm for, I'm glad that we're energy independent. Mm -hmm. Like these debates are becoming talked about more and more often because I said to you, this idea that democracy is on the line or these cultural issues are more front and center, they are more front and center. Mm -hmm. I would have never thought when I was 27 or 29 and a half years old, like my boys, I don't think about the things they think about today Mm -hmm. because, you know, they weren't front and center to me. Mm -hmm. I, I, one question I have is like, do you see what you do in terms of raising money as as helping them get there to kind of close that enthusiasm gap? Like, well, how do you actually view the role of like fundraising versus the work that they have to do to pull this off? Money's critical. Let's not underestimate that. Yes, both sides will be able to have a lot of money, but getting out the vote, getting data having the right research, being both on paid media and promoted media, you know, having a bunch of people work with the grassroots, that's important. To think that politics isn't local, Mm -hmm. to think that you can't, you know, you can do this, you know, national campaign and win, that's complete BS. Mm -hmm. People are tuning out, you know, you know, most people cut the cord. Mm -hmm. So the people that you have to get to, you got to be local. Mm -hmm. So I'm, like this idea that raising twenty six million is anything other than fantastic is ridiculous. Interesting, because you know, right now there's a lot of talk about how Trump can't raise a, a lot of money. How much do we think a money advantage matters? How much does a money disadvantage matter? You know, Donald Trump has no problem getting on media, right? Like he has no problem in that type of space. What do you think the money advantage can do yeah. for Biden? What do you hope? It so does? I think there's a bunch to unpack there. Um, yes, Donald Trump in some ways, owns the airwaves. You wake up to him, you go to sleep to him. Mm -hmm. But those are national airwaves. That's not where voting gets done. So the answer is yes. It's important to localize the campaign. It's important to tell someone in a certain area what they're, how they're helping your wages or how they're helping, you know, with, with climate action or why, you know, it's important that you're doing, you know, red flag laws in certain states on, Mm -hmm. on gun violence. The second part I would say is don't underestimate President Trump. He's going to be able to raise his money. Mm. You know, I've said this the other day, Mar-a-Lago is not some homeless shelter. Okay. So it's not like he doesn't have billionaires. Okay. Sitting there. Can't the the rumors of Trump is broke are <laughs> overblown. <laughs> I mean, th- that that's complete BS, right? Because you're going to have, you know, his tax policy is going to be front and center. Mm-hmm. And so these billionaires, you know, that some do vote one dimensional, they're going to make sure that he's got money to run on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is helpful because a lot of what we're reading now is about the lack of funds. You're saying you trust that in the end, maybe it's because of tax policy or just because of like, you know, of people's investment in Republicans. 
he, folks will give to him. I think, listen, I, I want to be clear here. I think President Biden's going to outraise him. Mm-hmm. I think we're going to outwork him. And I think having money early is important for building offices. I get what you're saying. But if you're telling me that we don't think that there's going to be money in the RNC or the Republican Party for a presidential election where the Senate's important and the House is important, we're kidding ourselves. Yeah, yeah. When you look about the next six months, is there a thing that worries you the most for the prospect of Biden getting reelected? Listen, I think if it's President Biden versus former President Trump, I think we're in a good seat. I don't think there's more people voting for President Trump than in the past, and I think it would be less. I am worried about the third-party situation because we saw what happened with Secretary Clinton. There was no question the third party impacted Secretary Clinton. And so, yeah, I'm nervous of what a third party can, how it impacts us. And if I ask the most brilliant people or pollsters in the world, they could not give me yeah, an answer because they, they don't know. We don't know. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm a Wall Street guy. I buy and sell things. Mm-hmm. I don't live great in this gray area. <laughs> okay, I just don't. Do you, and this is kind of the last question, I'm like, you know, Citizens United, Super PACs, there was so much talk about the influence of money in politics. Like, what's your assessment of it? Like, do you think, do you think campaigns are too expensive? Do you think there's too much money in it? Do you think that maybe money doesn't matter as much as folks saying and, you know, it's a lot a little overblown. No, yes, there's way too much money in it. It's insane. We're mm-hmm. going to spend billions and billions of dollars on this presidential election. And yeah, there's too much money in it. And for some, it's transactional, being an ambassador, being this. That's not where I am. But I guess to most people, this is the most important thing that they think about, you know, every four years. So, you know, it seems like it's, too much money at it. But then again, if you're saying the most important thing that happens every four years, I don't know. It doesn't seem that money v- much versus our annual GDP. Yeah, yeah, I hear what you're <laughs> saying. Um, well, thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you for joining Th- us. Thank you. Much appreciated. After the break, the other side of the money race. After talking to Robert Wolf, I wanted to get a bigger picture of the role of money in this race especially on the Republican side, where Trump has been lagging behind in donations while facing mounting legal bills. There's also the $175 million bond he just paid, the social media company going public, and those $60 Bibles he started selling. Um, Well, thank you for joining us. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) No, it's all good. It's all good. You're just allergic to me. Um, So I brought in my colleague Shane Goldmacher, national political correspondent for The Times, and the person I usually go to when I have questions about money and politics. I started by asking him what to make of Biden's big money advantage and Trump's financial struggles. It's a big gap, and I think the issue isn't just the size of the gap right now. It's the potential size of the gap in the coming months because, by all accounts, Democrats are expected to raise more money in the coming months than Republicans are. So that's the gap now, and it's expected to get even bigger Uh, Oh, wow. Throughout the rest of the race. What is the cause of it? I mean, one of them is just like a general structural cause, which is the candidate who's sitting in the White House tends to enter the general election with more money. Why is that? And just because people like giving money to the president? Some of it is people like giving money to the president. The more important is that they have controlled the party apparatus for the three years leading up to the beginning of the general election. And so Joe Biden has been raising money with the Democratic Party for Mm -hmm. basically a year at this point. And it gives you an advantage because Trump was raising in much tinier increments just to fight through the primary. You know, just to give you a sense of scale, Mm -hmm. during the primary, Donald Trump was raising $3,300 increments to win that Republican primary. That's Mm -hmm. the most he could raise from an individual person into his campaign account. Joe Biden was going around the country and raising in this big mega committee that he shares with the Democratic Party $929,000 $929,000 increments. And so you end up with a lot more money if you can raise in that big of a chunk. You're able to ask for more. You're able to ask for more. You have smaller donors that you can then fund by using those bigger contributions to advertise to get more small donors. It sort of builds upon itself. Interesting. Why does it cost so much and increasingly cost more for these campaigns? I mean, theoretically, these are two candidates the country knows. These aren't people who have name recognition problems. Why exactly are campaigns so expensive? I mean, the number one answer is television ads or the digital version of television ads. And look, you can spend an enormous amount of money on television 
really, really quickly. Just think about Mike Bloomberg's campaign when he ran for president, <laughs> right? He ran for president for only a few months, and he spent basically a billion dollars. He was blanketing the television ads for a period, but it is a reminder of how high up that number can run. If you're buying as many TV ads as you can, it's basically an unlimited amount of spending mm -hmm. that you can go. And so, like, what is the driver? The driver's television ads, first and foremost, and digital ads that now run on television, right? Like, a lot of people are streaming. But, yeah, running advertising is the overwhelming cost. Everything else you hear about, our field program, our ground game, it tends to be fractions of the dollar spent on advertising on television. Interesting. So what is driving that big advantage that you're talking about? Do we know where the money gap is coming from? Is Biden have a specific advantage among small donors, big donors? Like, how would we break down why he has so much more money on hand? I think there's important to think about in, in two time frames. The first is right now. Mm -hmm. And I think he has more money right now because he's been tapping those bigger institutional donors. Those people can give large chunks of money. The big Radio City thing we saw last week. Correct, right? That They had 5,000 people in the room. So there's a lot of smaller donors. You know what? There were also people raising or giving $100,000 mm -hmm. that they were going to get a picture with the president's, right? The next day, he had a smaller gathering of 175 of his donors in New York City. Those people got sort of personalized briefings from the entire senior campaign team. How much did that cost you? You had to, I think, have at least given 47000 something dollars, right? That is the entry level. The highest tier for his bundlers, $2.5 million. Wow. Now, if you're raising $2.5 million, you might not be going to a big group briefing. You might be getting the president visiting your house, right, on a fundraiser. But there's enough people that at a roughly $50,000 limit, you still have 175 of them coming to New York wow. for that personalized briefing. So— your first question, where is his advantage right now? It's a lot of these major donors, right? They have been tapped. They've built out a whole system. Joe Biden, Jill Biden, Kamala Harris, Doug Emhoff, they've been traveling around the country at events and scooping up big checks, right? In the coming months, though, there's a wider expectation that Joe Biden's advantage will be driven by smaller donors online, that online Democratic giving has become almost habitual for liberal donors who are amped up about an election, even about the candidates they may not be excited about. They give tons of money, right? Key Senate races are flooded with money yep. each cycle. And whether the Democrats a household name or not, they end up raising a lot of money. And there's a wide expectation that online, even if Democrats aren't enthused about Joe Biden, they're going to be enthused about giving money to stop Donald Trump. Okay, okay. Let's focus now on Donald Trump, someone who famously... Uh, has a lot of money until he doesn't. Why is he struggling in fundraising so much, considering he has historically done well with small-dollar donors? And it seems like what you're saying, those donations are slowing down. Why is that? Do we know? Yeah, I mean, I let me sit, give you an answer. I want to take one little step back, which is that, like, Trump is facing multiple different financial challenges all at once. It's hard to keep them straight. It is hard to keep them straight. So number one you're talking about is like politics. Like how much money right. does he have in his campaign account? And some of that is, look, he just got through a nominating contest and he was raising money and spending money to win the nomination. Now less than maybe some others have before. Usually at the end of that, you end up with a little bit less and you have to build up. Okay. And he hasn't had that joint agreement with the Republican Party until just now, basically, to raise those bigger chunks of money. In fact, he's doing that. Uh, just this coming week, he has a big event in Palm Beach that they've said they're going to raise $25, $30 million. I think they put out the number $33 million from a single dinner because he's getting all these people who have not given till to now. To do that. They're going to come and, you know, a couple, right? Each member of the couple gives $800,000. That's $1.6 million for that couple at that dinner. Okay, so this is his answer to Radio City. This is his answer. It's his coming it. out party for those mega donor this checks. It's it. just coming this week. So the first financial challenge is political, and he just has less money than Joe Biden does. The second one is his legal bills. Yeah. And he has been spending, now we've reported more than $100 million since he left the White House on legal bills. And the pot of money he's been tapping for that mostly has been this money raised in the aftermath of the 2020 election. And that money's almost all gone at this point. Is and, that a different pot? than the money he was spending to win the primary? It is a completely different pot. So what happened is at the end of 2020, he loses the election. And he says, please give to me, dear supporters, this thing was rigged. And there's no evidence this yet, but I'm going to fight this in the courts. I'm going to fight it everywhere I can. My election defense fund. 
And Republican donors gave more money to Donald Trump in the post-election period of 2020 than almost any period they gave during the actual campaign. That is so wild. They were so, (laughs) you know, denying the election result paid off for him. He raised $250 million online between the day after the election and the day that Joe Biden was inaugurated. So he spent some of that money fighting recounts or whatever, but you know what? He pocketed most of that money, not personally pocketed, but he put it in a political action committee. And that huge chunk of funds paid has been paying his lawyers ever since then. And so that money has been spent down slowly, slowly, now quickly and quickly. And the total amount of money left in the account that's been doing that, Save America, it's his political action committee, is less than $5 million at this point. Okay, so he's basically tapped out that post-2020 surge of money that he got through people giving out of the election denial space. Correct. Okay. And so he's facing not just a political shortfall versus Joe Biden, but this legal fund that he's been using to pay his lawyers, that's also going to be in a shortfall. And by the way, he's going on a trial soon. Yeah. The costs don't go down typically when you go on a criminal trial. Yeah, the legal problems have no signs of slowing in terms of what he has to owe. Correct. So the first one is that political, the second is this legal, and the third one, we have a little bit of resolution right now, but it has been a big one, has been like the bond he had to post in order to keep all of his businesses active during his appeal on one of the many cases he's faced, which is a civil fraud case in New York. And that just went down. From what I understand, the Times reported he posted a $175 million bond in his civil fraud case, which means that the New York authorities can't seize his assets while he's appealing that larger $450 million judgment against him. Can you just explain what that means in more simple terms? Yeah, the, that third category is like, can he keep his businesses and can they keep running in New York? Because the risk was that if he could not pay that, he would have to sell off the businesses to pay said judgment. Yeah, so he has lost the case and he's appealing that ruling. And under New York law, when you lose, you still have to pay basically the penalty. And so he's saying the penalty is so big, it was $454 million. It's so onerous that I can't even get a bond to do that. And so that has been reduced so it's now $175 million, and he has since lined up money. And so it's like a, you're borrowing in order to appeal. Mm-hmm. And eventually, look, if he loses at the appeal, appellate court level and he loses at the final, final court, then he will have to make a, an actual payment. But for now, he can borrow a bond to like stay off. And does that actual payment payments. have to be 450 or 175 uh, As of now, it's still the 450 But some of the legal experts say the fact that the bond itself was being reduced is maybe a sign that eventually a final judgment could be shrunk. But we don't know yet. Well, we previously talked to Maggie Haberman about how Trump's legal fees were basically consuming the campaign in the way that you really just laid out for us. But one thing I couldn't understand is like, what are the possible solutions he has to this? I know we have seen some of the efforts with things like Truth Social, his social media company, and other ways he's been trying to maneuver. I remember hearing about the RNC kind of having an open question about whether they would do it. What is his best shot to come up with some of these answers? I mean, the number one thing to remember is that he could, of course, pay for his own lawyers with his own money. He's chosen not to do so so far, right? He has chosen not to use his own personal finances to pay for oh, his you're attorneys. Like, all these buckets are separate from Donald Trump's bank account. Like, he could choose to use his bank account to solve the issue that he's running out of money to pay his lawyers. He's just running out of other people's money. It doesn't mean that he doesn't have any <laughs> that money That is left, an important reminder. <laughs> right? Like, he has his own set of money that he has chosen not to use to pay his lawyers in his multiple criminal cases because he had this big pot of money from 2020. So option one is... You just pay for them yourself. There's other more complicated options like you create a special legal defense fund. And what are the rules around that if you're an active candidate for president? There are other ways he can raise money into the PAC that has been paying the lawyers. And in fact, he's done a small thing along those lines, right? There was a little float. Well, will the RNC actually pay his legal bills? And they've said no. Okay. Absolutely not. But then th- that first mega committee we talked about, you can raise those really big checks. There's a sort of order of operations of who gets the money. The first always is the candidate, right? The candidate gets the money first. Typically, second is the party, like the national, the Republican National Committee. But in this case, Trump didn't actually put the party second. He put his PAC second. Right. And that PAC has been paying his lawyers. Mm-hmm. So we see Trump coming up with these sort of solutions. At this point, if I were to give... $100 to Donald Trump's campaign. Do we know how much of that is going to, you know, save America and the legal fees versus how much is going to the actual job of winning an actual election? Yes, yeah, since early last year, 10 cents of every dollar that's been given online has gone to that Save America account, 
which is paid almost exclusively for legal stuff. And so, yeah, all those small donors, it's 10% of what they've been giving for the last year, which is not an insignificant amount of money, and it's helped pay for some of those. Look, the intertwining of all these things is real, right? Like, to differentiate what is the Trump legal issues with what is the Trump political issues is kind of, it's a fool's errand, right? One of his lawyers was recently co-hosting a fundraiser for his super PAC, (laughs) right? So, like, they're not totally separate. They have been separate in terms of, like, actual cash flow, right? The campaign has not spent money on his personal lawyers. But the idea that they're, like, separate things, no, I think it's very much— the Donald Trump 2024 campaign is happening in and around courtrooms. Uh uh I know this is a really unprecedented situation that we're in, but, like— are these rules being made up as we go along or like? That is an existential question. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it is kind of. I'm like, because we've never been here, like, is he just test casting new theories about how you use money in politics? Like, is it just completely uncharted? It's a little bit uncharted. It's also that it's not just him, right? We're in basically 20 years of candidates testing new theories of how they want to spend and, and raise money in politics and very little policing by the group that's That's supposed to to oversee them. So, like, there are rules that Trump is taking advantage of that others have plowed before him. There are rules that he's expanding. But I would say that this is not just a Trump issue. This is just the broader regime of campaign finance that how we run this stuff is no longer a thing that makes intuitive sense to a regular American. You know, I wanted to ask specifically about the Truth Social, you know, Trump media as he's turned into a source of revenue. I've only been, like, kind of halfway following this storyline. I guess, like, help me understand how something can become such a campaign boon. Or was it? Or has it been? Yeah, so, you know, this is his private social media company, and it just went public. And on paper, Trump has become a multi-billionaire in a way that he really hasn't been. And so it's a dramatic increase in his wealth on paper, Mm -hmm. right? This is a stock that when they have to also file all these official reports now that you're a publicly traded stock, you have to reveal your books. And the books don't look like a multi-billion dollar company, right? There's nothing in the books that it's like $4.1 million of revenue last year that screams multi-billion dollar company. But what it does have is supporters who are buying this stock online and driving up the price. And we've seen this not just for Trump. We saw it in like all these meme stocks around GameStop, GameStop yes. AMC, right? And it bears a lot of similarity. Like the actual finances don't merit the valuations that it has on the market, but it is valued at what it's valued at. Now, Trump is the biggest shareholder. And so again, multi-billion dollar windfall, but he can't sell those shares yet. There's a bunch of rules about how long he has to wait. And so all of this is really like theoretical money for him Mm -hmm. and certainly very theoretical in terms of the campaign. Mm -hmm. I would actually pretty much wall that off because for now, that isn't money he has access to, Mm -hmm. and it's not expected to immediately impact the campaign. So that doesn't impact those initial three buckets, but it gives him money on paper that he can possibly leverage to solve one of his many other problems. Hope on the horizon. Got you, got you. Uh, What about these $60 Bibles? Should should we just expect, like, a level of Trump gimmickiness to raise money? Like, I guess I, I look at those things, and he's always felt someone willing to grift, to sell, to do whatever he needs to. Is your sense that we're entering a a moment of desperation for them? How should I read the Bibles? I wouldn't read it as something different in kind, right? Like, you go back to 2016 when he was winning those competitive primaries and he had Trump-branded stuff all around him. He was using that as a sales pitch opportunity. He went to SneakerCon to roll out his own (laughs) set of sneakers, right? He has rolled out his own picture book. Yeah, a Bible, I guess, you know, just the next step in the journey. The Bible is just, I mean, you know, it's hard to say it's just the next step. It's certainly a step, right? (laughs) But we've been on this pathway for a long time, right? Trump selling his name to Mm -hmm. sell things and make a profit. And again, this is money for him personally. This is not a Bible that you buy it from his campaign. That the campaign, this is just like a personal private business deal that he's entered into. Oh, this isn't even helping these buckets. This is just helping his own individual bank account, which he is not famously tapping to pay the lawyers. Or for his campaign, Uh right? He has not put money into his own political campaign. Basically, since he became the nominee in 2016, he relied on donors and the Republican Party ever since. 
That was such a huge part of his brand when he was running in 2016. It was like, I am not owned by these people. I mean, you talk to voters all the time. And it is still part of his brand. That's Republican what I'm saying. voters bring this up all the time. This is exactly what I was going to say is like, it's amazing how that brand has lasted. You know, it, it, but it hasn't in our reporting seeped into anyone. And I was going to ask you, have you heard someone think, oh, uh, uh, Donald Trump with less money is a less appealing Donald Trump? I mean, I think... Some of this is just sort of the media silos and what is the information that you're consuming. But I think on a regular basis and traveling in in Iowa, New Hampshire, and other parts of the the country this year, last year, during the primary, voters would bring up his independence and say he doesn't need to be running. He doesn't need the money that he is not beholden the way that Nikki Haley is beholden. He's not beholden the way that Ron DeSantis is beholden. And meanwhile, he is raising all the money from other people. But it was that initial spend that it was his own money and his vast claims of wealth and his idea that he didn't need their money, even if he's taking it, that has taken hold in such a real way. It's hard to overstate how important that's been in his appeal. I think not just to Republican primary voters, but across the board. Yeah, it is a core part of the brand, even if it's gotten further from the truth. I want to ask, like, you know, what do you think are the long-term impacts of this current cash crunch with Trump? Like, when it comes to the campaign, what will he not be spending money on? What will you not see from the campaign that otherwise, if he was flush, we would have seen? You know, we're talking a lot about money, but I think that money is often vastly overrated. This is my next question. And it's importance in presidential elections in particular, right? I've covered House races and Senate races, and in an average House candidate running, right, they're not known in their community. Even the best House candidates aren't particularly well-known. So if somebody comes and spends a million dollars on television ads, that dominates the average voter's knowledge of those candidates. Mm -hmm. With Donald Trump and Joe Biden, a bunch of advertising isn't introducing you to these two candidates. Yep. You know who these candidates are. You even know some of their positions on issues, right? And so money is incredibly important in American politics. It is least important in the biggest races, right? right? I guess with that in mind then, what does it do? It does a few things. I mean, the number one thing I think that it does is it allows the candidate or the campaign with more money to expand the map of what they're looking at at presidential politics, right? If you are the Joe Biden campaign and you know that Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania are your absolute must-win states, right? You want to hold those three. You hold those three states and you win the one little electoral college vote in Nebraska, you can get Mm reelected, right? But that's not where they're spending exclusively. They're also spending in Nevada, in Georgia, yeah. in Arizona. They just released a memo about Florida. They're releasing a memo about Florida, but like, let's see if they spend yeah, real yeah, money we'll in see, Florida. We'll <laughs> right, but like North Carolina, which they lost last time, right? Even as he won by a relatively large electoral college, they are spending in a state that he lost by the most narrow margin because they have enough right now to spread the map. So, right, if you're the Democrats, elections aren't usually won in the winter, spring before the election. But you can get an edge, right? If you're Joe Biden, you enter this campaign behind in most public polling. The money is allowing you to either close that gap or build things like campaign offices that can pay off over time. But it's really the like, how thin can you stretch the defenses of your opponent? Can you make them need to spend money in North Carolina if you're Trump and take away from the state that he may otherwise have to win. Right. And, and to the speaking of the importance of this period of the race, the place we have seen the Biden campaign be the weakest is probably with enthusiasm among kind of core constituents. They talk a lot about kind of bringing people home right now and wanting to do that even more so than they think about persuasion or all that type of things come later in the year. When we think about the impact of money, like how much love can money buy? Like when you think about the impact of that, specifically the people who are probably Democrats, but maybe soft on Biden. Is that ads that they're supposed to convince them? Is that text? Is that door knocking? Is it, I guess it's all of the above? Yeah, I mean, I think that the most recent New York Times poll we did had Trump winning 97% of the people who voted for him in 2020 Mm -hmm. and had Joe Biden winning 83% of the people who voted for him in 2020. That gap tells you why Joe Biden was losing in that poll. Mm -hmm. And so what they're going to try to do is use their money advantage to tell that chunk of Democratic voters, this election is coming, and depending on the place, give them a reason to care Mm -hmm. or to highlight their awareness, right? You know, I live this every day. You live this every day. 
this is not a central part of most people's lives. Yep. And if you're an average voter, the whole promise of Joe Biden was partly I didn't need to care about politics every day, right? And so people have intentionally tuned out. Mm-hmm. And so they're trying to re-engage voters who might be likely to vote for Joe Biden, but not likely to be tuned into why they should care yet. And sometimes that's advertising, sometimes that's spending in other ways that are trying to reach them, but that is their chief goal. And money is one of the ways they're trying to to Mm -hmm. solve it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Shane. I really appreciate it. This was really helpful. All right. Thank you. As of Wednesday morning, just as Shane and Robert predicted, Republican fundraising numbers were going up. The Republican National Committee and the Trump campaign announced that they'd raised over $65 million in March, ending the month with $93 million in cash on hand. The Biden campaign has yet to release its March total, though a campaign spokesperson said we can expect the numbers in the coming days. That's the run-up for Thursday, April 4th, 2024. And now, the rundown. All right, this morning, counting votes in four states that had presidential primaries. Yes. Voters in Wisconsin, New York, Rhode Island, and Connecticut went to the polls on Tuesday. And although Biden and Trump won all those states easily, there were warning signs for both campaigns. On the Republican side... This primary is long over, but look at the support for Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley won at least 10 percent of the vote in all four states, despite having dropped out of the race last month. And on the Democratic side. More than 45,000 people in Wisconsin voted uninstructed. That's the terminology. People continue to voice their disagreement with Biden's handling of the war in Gaza by staging a protest vote at the ballot box. Also this week. Donald Trump held rallies in Michigan and Wisconsin. And in his speeches... Under crooked Joe Biden, every state is now a border state. Every town is now a border town. His rhetoric about immigration escalated. The 22-year-old nursing student in Georgia who was barbarically murdered by an illegal alien animal. Uh, The Democrats say, please don't call them animals. They're humans. I said, no, they're not humans. They're not humans. They're animals. He used dehumanizing language about migrants. But it's a border bloodbath, and it's destroying our country. It's a very bad thing happening. And call what's happening at the border a bloodbath. There are now 102 days till the Republican National Convention, 137 days till the Democratic National Convention, and 215 days till the general election. See you next week. The Run-Up is reported by me, Estet Herndon, and produced by Elisa Gutierrez, Caitlin O'Keefe, and Anna Foley. It's edited by Rachel Dry and Lisa Tobin, with original music by Dan Powell, Marion Lozano, Pat McCusker, Diane Wong, Sophia Landman, and Alicia B. Etube. It was mixed by Sophia Landman and fact-checked by Caitlin Love. Special thanks to Paula Schumann, Sam Dolnick, Larissa Anderson, David Haufinger, Maddie Masiello, Mahima Chablani and Jeffrey Miranda. Do you have a question about the 2024 election? Email us at therunup at nytimes.com. Or better yet, record your question using the voice memo app on your phone. And then send us the file. The email again is therunup at nytimes.com. And finally, if you like the show and want to get updates on latest episodes, follow our feed wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening, y'all.